Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, the failures of September 11th and the failures of the global war launched on September 12th. Our guest, Colleen Rowley, is a retired special agent and former Minneapolis Division Legal Counsel of the FBI, who taught constitutional law and law enforcement ethics to FBI agents and other law enforcement, then became a whistleblower about the FBI's pre-9-11 failures and the folly of the Iraq invasion. She was named, along with two other corporate whistleblowers, as Time Magazine's 2002 Persons of the Year. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Huffington Post, and others. Ms. Rowley is also a senior fellow at the Eisenhower Media Network, an organization of independent veteran military and national security experts. Colleen Rowley, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Hi, Thanks David. for being here. Thanks for what you've been doing for the past 20 years or more. Um, is, this, uh, is this some sort of a moment of victory at long last for those of us in the peace movement who've been saying in this war for 20 years and before it started, or is it too encumbered with ongoing dishonesty and warmongering to, to treat it like that? Uh, yeah, I think it's the latter. Um, and for one reason, which is that besides the peace movement wanting to end the wars in the Mideast, some of the smarter geo strategists actually have been urging that, but their their uh, motivation was not to, to get peace in the world. Their motivation was to pivot to China and Russia, uh, what they call the peer rivals who they think pose a greater danger. So some of these smarter ones, now some of the generals who were invested didn't want to ever end the wars because they don't want to be blamed for having lost a war, just as happened in Vietnam. But I think that some of the younger ones realized that this quagmire that they had gotten stuck in for 20 years was keeping them from going on to the bigger prizes. Now the problem for for all of us is that these bigger prizes are two other nuclear superpowers. So, you know, as bad as it was with these terrible wars of mostly bombing, you know, I, I wrote this uh, article a long time ago about how we had gotten to the point where advisors, top level advisors were not even calling it war anymore when we when they urged uh, Obama to uh, carpet bomb Libya uh, Cole, I think his name's Harold Cole, the former dean of, of the Yale Law School, who was advising Hillary Clinton, said, we won't have to worry about Congress when they demand uh, that they, they get to authorize the war after 90 days under the war powers. We won't have to worry about that because you know what? It's not really war when we don't suffer any casualties and it's just bombing that foreign country. And that's that's really pretty incredible when you get to that stage where you, you're not even calling it war because they're not fighting back. You're just killing. But the thing is, they still made it euphemistic. They didn't say, well, what is it then if it's not war? Well, then it's just outright murder. I don't know what else you would call it if it wasn't war. Um, so the, the problem is this, this going on in the Mideast this long uh, did uh, keep them from going on to, to even more terrible. And frankly, these will be terrible consequences, not just for the United States going to war with Russia and China, Iran, uh, other countries. It will actually be for the entire world, especially if uh, they do press the button on, on nuclear uh, nuclear bombs, which is We've, we've come close in the past several times, so it's it's the most worrisome thing in the there's world a, right There's now. a bill in the Senate, Colleen Rowley, you may know, Senator Chris Murphy and a couple others, I think grand total of three co-sponsors going nowhere, that would <laughs> revise the War Powers Resolution to make war and hostilities include bombing a country, even if U.S. troops aren't admittedly on the ground in that country, so that so that you, you couldn't bomb a country and not call it hostilities anymore, which you've got lawyers like Harold Coe telling Congress, it's not hostile, it's just bombs. Well, at the very same time, you've got lawyers telling Congress these drone strikes, these drone murders are illegal unless they're part of a war. They're murder unless they're part of war, then they're fine. But it's not a war because you know, it's, I, I can't make any sense of it. 
Well, I don't think they want you to make sense of it. They just want you to uh, <laughs> to go along with it. And, and, you know, very few people ask these questions or, you know, actually find these inconsistencies. Uh, the lawyers are, unfortunately, a lot of these lawyers, like Co, are working for the, the war hawk, war profiteering, military industrial yeah. complex. You get very few. I remember looking at the drone bombing and there was this one woman out of Notre Dame I think there was one female law professor standing up to two or three other law professors oh no it's perfectly legal there's no problem with this blah 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 I mean that it's it's sad I don't even see her really speaking out uh, not so much no <laughs> um, but can you remind people Colleen wh- how you got in the news 20 years ago over one of the many ways in which the crimes of September 11th, 2001 could have been avoided. Well, uh, back after after 9-11, or actually on the day of 9-11, many of us realized that it could have been prevented very easily if there had been information sharing. And this was actually later confirmed by the 9-11 Commission. The 9-11 Commission blocked out a lot, and Zellico, who wrote the 9-11 Commission report, skewed it uh, big time to go along with the narrative. However, I think they got one thing right, at least one thing, which was that it was a simple failure within agencies to share information. Officials would deny that they didn't read their memos. I mean, these memos had their names on them. Uh, one one really important memo I wasn't even aware of at the time was in April 2001, entitled, this is in the FBI, it went to eight or nine of the top assistant directors, their names were right on it, and it was Bin Laden and the Chechen terrorist Abu Qatab are entwined and going to attack. This was April 2001, five months beforehand. Now, afterwards, none of these officials could remember seeing that memo. That memo uh, was a narrow mischance because one of the reasons why the FBI headquarters denied the uh, Minneapolis agents an emergency authorization to search Musawi's belongings and laptop, um, it, they asked for an emergency FISA because they knew he was a terrorist suspect from, the, from day one, from the first time these whistleblower uh, flight instructors called the FBI. They knew right away that he was, uh, you know, up to up to the same thing. He got charged and convicted for the same thing. They knew this in, in two days later. So the the um, going back when when we knew this already on 9/11, uh, we knew it was information sharing that was blocked in the FBI. It was then not uh, communicated to the Federal Aviation Administration which knew they had to lock the doors to the cockpits. There had already been all of these unruly passengers and and crazy people that had tried to get into the cockpits long before uh, Al-Qaeda attack. But it cost a few hundred dollars to put a lock on the door to the cockpit. Now, if that warning had been stronger, it got watered down by headquarters, uh, but if it had been stronger, they might have invested the money, and that would have easily prevented 9-11, because that was, the, that was the key thing, is getting access to the cockpit. Not only that, but no, none of these uh, offices knew what the other offices were sharing, so that was a failure of, to share information inside the agency. I wrote, I didn't even know the half of it. I didn't know that the CIA, for instance, maybe also the NSA, I think uh, NSA whistleblowers say that they were also monitoring the uh, hub, the Al-Qaeda hub, so they knew this as well, the NSA. But I know the CIA was actually monitoring Al-Qaeda for a couple of years. The same figures, some of the same hijackers. And they failed to tell the FBI uh, about this, and not only that, but that these some of them had come into the United States until it was too late. To this day, the uh, one FBI agent has admitted that he lied on the official inquiries and that he was never able to tell about the CIA because he was told he had to lie by the CIA. Um, so we still haven't gotten the full truth about any of this lack of sharing. The last important thing I think that very few people recognize is that the 9-11 Commission said it was a failure to share information with the public 
Okay, so that's the key thing. It's not only inside these secret agencies and between the secret agencies, but also with the public. And one good example of information that actually help, if we know things, uh, we can do things that will, you know, we first of all, we can pressure our, our, our representatives a little better if we know what's going on. But secondly, we can actually take action ourselves. The passengers in that one flight uh, forced their plane down in Pennsylvania. That plane was heading for uh, one of the, maybe Congress, maybe the White House, no one knows. But, you know, look at what they prevented. They prevented terrorism just by having 10 minutes of knowledge and information. And that's a great example of where sh lack of sharing of information with the public is absolutely crucial. Okay, after 9-11, what did they do? Everything's top secret, you know. There, there was a little moment in time where some of the more enlightened figures thought they would share more uh, intelligence in these databases. And then um, Chelsea Manning and WikiLeaks happened, and they went right back to everything being classified. And I think we're at, the, at a worse stage where they're not even sharing information between agencies anymore. And they're, and they're putting things compartmentalized. So I think it's right back to, to even probably worse than it was before 9 Colleen Rowley, I've always thought of what Chelsea Manning did as a huge favor to the public. Are you suggesting there was a, there was a downside to it? <laughs> well, oh, the downside only comes from this narrow-minded uh, uh, approach by officials in power. Um, you know, I saw this quote today, and I'm not sure who said it. Um, it was in connection with Daniel Hale's being imprisoned um, because Daniel Hale revealed, you know, illegal war crimes that the United States was committing. And if I can remember the quote, it's something like, when, um, when the crime, when, when telling the truth becomes a crime, oh, darn, I, no, I, <laughs> I forgot it, <laughs> and, you know, basically, when, when it's a crime to, to tell about a crime, when it, be, when it becomes a crime to divulge a crime, you know the criminals are in charge. That's the quote. And I think that's the problem we have. If you have people that are wanting to do things that are not legal or right, they, they love secrecy because this buys them time. It may eventually come out 30 years from now, 40 years from now, whatever, but they well, bought themselves one of the time. impacts of this 20 years of warmongering has been greater and greater secrecy, greater and greater militarism, greater and greater authoritarianism. Uh, and similar actions were treated as crimes. Even attacks on the same buildings in New York, the World Trade Center, were treated as crimes and not as excuses to go off and commit greater crimes, uh, otherwise known as war. Uh, what what has been the history in terms of treating these crimes as crimes? I know we've still got people locked up in Guantanamo, so they can't, quote unquote, return to a battlefield that, as far as we know, they were never on and now supposedly no longer exists, but they're still locked up there. Uh, has, what's, what's the history in terms of law enforcement around these crimes, treating them as crimes? Well, I argued this exactly with uh, retired CIA legal counsel, a guy named John Radson, who became a law professor here. And we had dueling op-eds um, during the Musawi trial, because this John Radson, who, by the way, worked for Rizzo at the CIA when Rizzo got the torture legalized, etc. So I don't know what Radson's agenda was, but he wrote an op-ed saying we should never try a terrorist like Musawi in court. And I wrote an op-ed back. I, I, of course, in hindsight, you know, I turned out to be totally right because Musawi was like the only one ever actually tried in court. And so the other ones, even the masterminds, the, the supposed masterminds are still sitting on Guantanamo. They've all been tortured. They have really messed this up big time. And I don't know how you can even undo it. It's so messed up because they have to acknowledge that they tortured. You're going back to what I just said about the crimes. You have to acknowledge that you tortured. They fought tooth and nail. This torture report is still top secret. That won't be released. 
So we're still up to our eyeballs. You know, I keep writing to people, this is waist deep in the big muddy. <laughs> and at this point, we're about up to our eyeballs in the, in the big muddy. And the big fool keeps, keeps saying, push on. You know, there's just, as Obama said this, never look back. We can never look back. We just have to move forward. That's basically right. Pete Seeger's song. And this is the foolishness of listening to fools tell you, oh, it'll be great. All those generals in Afghanistan for 20 years. Oh, victory is just over the horizon. Just push on. The same type of thing. It's, I, I, it's sad that we can't get more people to understand these kinds of things that they go on in every war. You know, that's why Pete Seeger sang the song for Vietnam. It goes on every time, and yet here we are again. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. If they had used the law enforcement approach from the start and not called it the global war on terror, wars, the whole thing doesn't work. War on poverty, war on drugs, none of these wars work anyways. They should have just used the standard law enforcement approach, used a court. Courts actually give out information. The people learn things if they go into court. Maybe that's another reason why they didn't want to go into courts. Uh, actually, even the Musawi case, we fought tooth, our office fought tooth and nail to get that case into court. I don't know, people don't know the background of this, but our office was being squashed. Uh, this is after 9-11 has already occurred. And so our office was sending out the information this to is all the, the other FBI office in Minneapolis. Were, yes. And they, the, the officials were up to their eyeballs in this, and no one wanted to admit, of course, take any kind of responsibility for people dying. You can understand that as a, you know, people are not going to own up to these types of things afterwards. But still, they were keeping this under wraps. And the only way it got out was because the Minneapolis office kept writing this summary of the Musawi case at the beginning of all of the outgoing communications and kind of forced it. Uh, eventually, Ashcroft to charge uh, to charge him, but yeah, that was the answer: is to treat this as law enforcement and uh, not to have started. But the problem was, as you well know, that agenda that grew up with Dick Cheney and the Project for the New American Century and all these neocon war hawks. They knew that if they got a new so-called new Pearl Harbor, that would allow them then to uh, propagandize and lie the, the country into their what they want, thought was a glorious regime change goal for the whole Mideast. This actually goes back to Madeleine Albright. Madeleine Albright had this vision of democratizing the world. So they, these neocons glommed onto that. And when they got their chance, like you say, on, on, uh, on September 12th, they were already saying, yay, yay, we got our chance. We're going to do it. We're going to go for all the countries now, the whole list of six or seven countries, and we'll change them, and then we'll, then we'll have peace and prosperity forever. I don't know what their, what their, uh, what their uh, vision was exactly, but it's, you know, they fool themselves pretty easily. <laughs> if not peace, at least war profits. Uh, uh, Colleen, we were talking before <laughs> off the air about also some – uh, instances of prosecuting the wrong people during the course of this uh, fiasco. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, before I talk about the one terrible case I learned about uh, because of Gareth Porter's investigative reporting, um, and I had a direct role in this case, I, I'm really ashamed of myself now that I didn't realize it at the time. Uh, but before I say that, you know, the, they – were able to get the United States 70% of Americans to believe that Saddam was behind 9-11. And then a lot of them to believe that Iran was behind 9-11. They got a judge, a federal judge, to believe that Iran was behind 9-11. Uh, these are actually the enemies of al-Qaeda. Uh, Saddam was an enemy and so was uh so was Iran, in, in a way, the strategic enemies. But they got the United States to believe that, you know, opposites. So if you go back to 96, I'll talk about the Cobar Towers but this, but this, case. But Colleen, I just want to emphasize this point you just made. This is the public in the United States that's qualified for democracy, whereas the Iraqis and the Afghans are too stupid, <laughs> and this is why you can't bomb them into democracy. <laughs> They're too stupid to believe that Saddam was behind 9-11 and you should rush out and guzzle horse medicine. They just, they just aren't up to the standards of this society we're living in, right? 
Yeah, that's, you know, we're exceptional. So we see things through our own superior lens, not terribly different than other civilizations in history. The other empires in history have had this blinding hubris. And, you know, if you think you're exceptional, then everybody else is below you. It's, it's the reason behind slavery and everything else. So very, very sad. Um, but I'll just tell you, of one of the major clues leading up to 9-11, you know, they were kind of blinded and not rec wanting to recognize that Saudi, that what came out of Saudi Arabia, the jihadists that Zbigniew Brzezinski funded and armed in order to fight the Soviet Union, um, probably bin Laden and certainly the Chechen leader, were assets of the United States, CIA assets in a way because we were arming and funding them as proxies to fight against the Soviet Union. But what came out of that in the 90s was covered up. And one of, there were, there were bombings in Saudi Arabia, yeah, in Riyadh first, and then later there was this terrible one in Kobar Towers. Um, it was a complex that, where dormitory for, air, for the Air Force. And uh, 19 air, airmen died, were killed, one of whom was from Minnesota. And 300 and some were wounded and, and hurt, really bad. And so the FBI was not really allowed to investigate that. The Saudis did it all. They caught people and tortured confessions out of them. They wouldn't let the FBI have access. They even started to bulldoze the scene. There was all kinds of shenanigans that went on with Saudi Arabia that now look like, I didn't know this at the time, but looked like they were protecting al-Qaeda. And, of course, their, their motive is to blame their minority Shia that they say are aligned with their enemy, Iran. So they, they um, got Louis Free, who, who actually micromanaged the case, and he wouldn't allow the best agents, the bin Laden unit, uh, the CIA wouldn't allow their bin Laden unit either. Both of them were kept out of the case. And Louis Free, on his last day in office on June 21st, 2001, a couple months before 9-11, indicts this Shia group uh, for 12 people get indicted for the bombing of Kobar Towers. My personal role, and I feel just terrible about it, is I was the victim witness coordinator, and I had to go give messages and, and communications to the victims uh, the family, the parents, and the wife here in Minnesota of this poor of this poor guy who died, and I recognized that was all BS. I was telling them. I went to a, a conference with Louis Free giving talks to the families. This is to the victim families, and if you read Gareth Porter's uh, long investigative series about Kobar Towers, there's just a lot of evidence that has. Uh, indicated, and a lot of officials now, it's not Gareth Porter, he's interviewed a lot of officials who now believe that it was always Al-Qaeda that bombed Kobar Towers, not a Shia uh, group that, that aligned with Iran, that, that Saudi Arabia, um, you know, uh, what's the word, when, when you, uh, <laughs> when you, uh, when you make somebody the, the culprit, they, they scapegoated, you know, but it's not even that. It's worse. They blame them for something just so, as There's a some as similarities a there, in fact, perhaps to the crimes of September 11th, 2001, that there is a significant Saudi role, I think, is fairly well established, certainly a bigger Saudi role than a than a Taliban role, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Um, and those. 28 pages were blacked out from the uh, Joint Intelligence Committee, and, and then the 9-11 Commission writer, Zellico, kept them out. It took the families, uh, what, 15, more than 15 years to finally get a law passed and get access to those 28 pages. And now they have a case going on that they're suing Saudi Arabia. Um, of course, now we know that Saudi heads of Saudi Arabia, uh, butcher people and embassies, you know, so maybe it's a little easier to believe now that Saudi Arabia had this role in 9-11, but all those, uh, I saw a picture of uh, Bush, Cheney, and Condi Rice sitting on their balcony with the um, Saudi ambassador, and I don't, I don't know that they ever knew the date of this, 
And it looks like they're just yucking it up, you know. And if this was after 9/11, this is incredible. How are we going to, how are we going to uh, shield Saudi Arabia from this? And uh, of course, Michael Moore's movie uh, kind of got into that a little bit. But it's it's uh, it, that's it's exactly on all fours. And again, it's amazing what you can get people to believe, even though 15 of the 19 hijackers yeah. and were the Saudis. Saudi butchers in the embassies are trained by the U.S. military, and the Taliban wants to know what's worse about them than the Saudis. Uh, Colleen Rowley, we have just about three minutes left, and uh, one of your many qualifications, uh, you're a senior fellow at the Eisenhower Media Network, and I was reminded of Eisenhower recently. Uh, when President Biden made a speech about Afghanistan where he lamented the cost and the alternatives and all the human goods that could have been achieved with all the money wasted on the war on Afghanistan while simultaneously pushing the Congress to increase military spending in the middle of ending a war with, with the Republicans and the Democrats in the Congress fighting each other to increase it beyond Biden's increases. Uh, I, I was, uh, fairly or not, I was reminded of President Eisenhower, who oversaw massive military spending while denouncing it as stealing food out of the mouths of the hungry. Uh, what's your view of the situation? You know, I think politicians go to school to learn this kind of savvy double talk. <laughs> and, you know, again, you know, you got to go back to the people here. How can you listen to these inconsistent things and not say, hey, it's not adding up? You know, uh, but people do, and they have their, their emotional loyalties, and that's the problem. And the politicians are very, very good at uh, finessing, and, uh, you know, I, I always give you a pat on the back when you, when you write stuff, because you're one of the few people, you're one of the few people that I see that can really dissect it quickly. Uh, most people can't, you know, maybe, like you say, 10 years later, they say, oh, this, you know, it wasn't consistent, whatever. But, but, but at the time when this silvery tongue, uh, euphemistic things are coming out of people's mouth, people want to believe, I, I guess that's it, they want to believe so hard in the fact that they're, they're good, that we're good, that everyone's so good, well-motivated, and so I, I, I don't know. I'm I'm more of a stark realist these days, <laughs> and I'm almost to the point where I'm cynical about some of this stuff because it's just been 20 years of seeing how people lie well. They can lie really, really they well. They absolutely can, and you tell the truth very, very well. Colleen Rowley, we need more honesty and more accuracy in the world, and we appreciate uh, what you've been doing all of these years. Uh, keep doing it. We've been speaking with... Colleen Rowley, Colleen, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Dot org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.